shake things around. Welcome to Exploring the Arts. I'm your host, Ed Cole. Today we're down in Rockport, Bearskin Neck, at the gallery of David Arsenal. Well, I want you to meet my new friend, David Arsenal. David, thanks for having me here today. Pleasure, Ed. And I want you to know I've been an admirer of your work for some time. Very kind. Of thank you. Literally was walking through here one day, through all the galleries, looked into one of your windows and saw your work. I said, my gosh, that reminds me a little bit of Edward Hopper. Am I right? How that all Many have come to that conclusion, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and for good reasons. Too. Yeah. Ironically, it was uh, seeing Hopper's work as I was uh, putting books away as a grade school uh, library assistant back in uh, upstate New York, Avery mm -hmm. Park High School uh, School District, um, and seeing uh, his painting Gas in a Time Life book. It just grabbed me in such a, a immediate and direct way. I, I had never felt like that about anything before. The image was just so compelling to me, and it was as if I was meeting uh, a twin or a lost brother or someone who just knew how to talk to me in a way that nobody else had ever done so. It wasn't really a seed that started sprouting until I got into graphic design school when I was in uh, my mid-30s and I was uh, attending a college in upstate New York, and uh, one of my professors introduced the, the, the section on uh, perspective and showed some of Hopper's work in relation to perspective and all of a sudden there it was again and the lights went off and I got excited and I went to the library and pulled out everything I could find on Hopper because I had to see as much as I could possibly see about his work because again I felt like I had come home. This was something that was meant for me in some way. I didn't understand how or why but I had to learn more. It's almost like Hopper was speaking directly to you because yeah. I know the feeling. But before you get into doing your your paintings, which you do today, mm -hmm. you said that you studied graphic art. I did. Tell me a little bit about... Well, I went to graphic school. Unfortunately, back in those days, in the 90s, most schools still introduced you to the hand skills first, drawing, illustrating, two-dimensional design, painting. Mm -hmm. um, and so <laughs> before I sat down at a computer, I was getting a chance to get back in touch with the fine art experiences that I had when I was in education as a high schooler. And that started getting me interested in and started getting some of the rust off those skills and, and started getting me thinking in a little bit different way, although I was still thinking about what am I going to do with this graphics degree. And I was working for a company at the time, um, an educational publisher, who um, needed someone in their advertising department. And so I was kind of using that as a goal uh, for the graphics program. But meanwhile, in the back burner, I'm starting to get these ideas about fine art again. And then um, I decided that I had to do it because that was the closest thing I had felt to being inspired about anything. And so in 1994, I started studying painting, and I did so for just a very short time um, before I started getting the kind of feedback that really was encouraging me to continue on and decide to start showing my work professionally. I know from my own experiences, I was an art teacher, mm -hmm. and um, I've always been a closet cartoonist. <laughs> and I can remember that risky idea of I'm going to give up teaching and I'm going to do this cartooning and it was something that pulled me and I couldn't I couldn't stop. Mm -hmm. I noticed I read something about you. You said that uh, you have a very limited palette. I do. Will you explain that? I can. It's limited only in terms of the base colors that I use, uh, but in terms of what I can make from it, it seems limitless, um, and that's part of why I've kept it as it is. Um, it's a palette that was introduced to me by one of my professors in art school. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just two blue reds, two blues, two reds, and two yellows, and white. Um, and they have cool aspects in one set of the palette, warm aspects on the other side. And it allows me to mix and match um, all the colors that I need uh, from that simple base. Um, because for me, uh, the goal has always been not to focus on the technical, not to mm -hmm. be um, slick and, and, and achieving new levels of, of excellence in, in how I manipulate the tools. It's how, um, what I can create from the tools. Mm -hmm. and, and having a palette like that allows me to be very um, detached from that aspect of it because I know it so well and because I'm so confident that I'm going to get the colors I want in order to produce the paintings I want. 
that I can focus on why I'm painting, which for me is always about trying to create a sense of time, trying to create a sense of place, trying to focus on expressing a certain feeling from the light using color and using the, the harder edges of things like architecture to really express a yeah, one distinct the, brick. One of the things I love about your work is uh, the eye that you have, mm. the way you see things, the way you compose your work, uh, composition, mm. uh, the sense of perspective. You mentioned the perspective before. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you only draw a fragment of a building, not the whole building. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you tease a person into the work a little bit. There's the <laughs> one I noticed on the video that I ever watched. You were talking and you were doing a painting of this tree, mm -hmm. which you hung up a swing from. A swing, yes. yes. Yeah. That's it was so scene. simple and it was yeah. so neat and just suggestions of things. Mm -hmm. Is that a very conscious thing you try to do before you set up a work? Uh, the composition how do you, aspect? Yeah, of the composition. How do you do it? Because I think that's what makes the work so amazing. Is oh, well, not just the color, but the mm -hmm. composition. I feel like, on, in a certain way, there's, there's the, the goal of an artist should be kind of an orchestration of sorts. You know, I have all of these interesting objects in my paintings. I have all of these interesting shapes and colors and the light, of course. And how am I going to arrange those things in such a way that it communicates a sense of what I'm feeling about what I see. Um, so that hopefully it will make something that will allow you to connect with either your experience of that place and time, or uh, maybe your feelings about something like that, to be able to be able to reach you in some way so that it touches you, so that you can reconsider either the way you see the world or maybe that moment in time. You know, like when I looked at that swing, that empty swing, I thought, if he put a figure in there, it would have blown the whole thing, yeah. you know? <laughs> and that was part because of the... That's kind of because it's so packed in such a composed way mm. that putting one element can almost wreck a painting. Absolutely, right? absolutely. And how do you prevent yourself from doing that or overpainting something? Yeah, that's... Um, sometimes it's just going with your gut, you mm -hmm. know, trying to keep it as simple as possible. What, what is it that I'm responding to here and not overthinking it? Um, because I, I think that that's when you really get yourself in deep is when you start thinking more well, let's see what would happen if I did this and what, what maybe I should overpaint that maybe I should change this color or maybe I should do this or that and some of that definitely has to happen because every time you work a certain passage in a painting the other passages look different by comparison and so you have to have a response in another part of the painting as well um, but at the same time you also have to be trying to keep your focus on what it is that you're motivated to do in that particular piece that's why I, I like to focus on simplicity. The clearer I am with the composition, the more likely it is that you're going to feel something and whatever it is, I don't get to tell you what that is because you're you. Um, you're coming from your own story and from your own life and from your own experiences. But hopefully it will be something that will hit you in a certain way because it's not complicated and it's not overwrought with, uh, with thinking. Mm -hmm. Do you ever use photography? in terms of uh, your work? My phone is, is, is my tool um, for helping me capture things that catch my eye. Mm -hmm. Even if it's just as, you know, this element could possibly be part of the painting or this kind of light could be interesting to make well, it a little worse. Yeah. So assume you're doing an interior painting or something yeah. and you had taken a picture of this in another setting mm -hmm. that has no connection really to your painting. You draft that image and work it into the new piece? Yeah, absolutely. Well, absolutely. Yeah. Kind of... Uh, uh, com cutting things in, you yeah. know, composing, again, as part of the composing yeah. thing, is, yeah. is putting things together in a way that seems to be interesting. Mm -hmm. And it has to keep coming back to me in a way that I, I need to keep feeling something about it. Otherwise, I won't do anything with it. Shadows are really important in your work, aren't they? Yes, uh, in the sense that they allow for a much more um, dramatic offset to the light. Um, shadows have to be, they have to reveal something. They're, they're not, I mean, the world is not black and white, literally or figuratively. Mm -hmm. um, and so the shadows have to have some interesting things kind of lurking in there, um, a suggestion of what's lit but not. Um, but the most important thing they do is serve as the foil for the light. Mm -hmm. um, and the more drama there is in the contrast, I think the more interesting it is potentially to have meaning. Yeah. So, um, how do you get your inspiration then? What inspires you? Um, it, literally, you know, seeing, just seeing, um, there's something about light, there's something about the world we live in, uh, the shapes that we've made as human beings, how they relate to the shapes of nature, 
uh, the colors, uh, just something, there's a feeling in, in all of it. Um, and and I'm, I'm always trying to find something that I have a strong feeling response to. Uh, and inevitably something happens, as long as I don't try to force it. And I, I just try to keep open, basically. I don't try to say, okay, now I'm going to go out and find, out, stop, find something. Because inevitably when you try to do that, you're not going to. Mm -hmm. And on a typical day, how, how much of that time is spent actually painting? I would say uh, it's changed from when I was uh, painting without owning my own gallery. I used to be more of a, of a morning artist. Mm -hmm. um, that's the time of day that I feel the freshest and the most engaged. Uh, but I've become more of an afternoon painter. And, and often, uh, this time of year in particular, now that things have started slowing down in town, I have uh, four, five, six hours I can paint on a daily basis. Do you work on more than one painting at once? Not typically. Uh, I've done that occasionally, but most of the time, uh, at least in the last probably decade or, or more, I, I'm pretty linear about it. I, I have a start to finish. And, and occasionally I'll get kind of caught up in the details and I'll, I'll want to set something aside so I can work looser and more freely and make large shapes and colors. Um, and I'll start something else. But by and large, I'm, I'm linear and I'm starting with When you're, when you're, you're doing the work and uh, it's not going the way you want, what do you do? Do you just give up on it or do you start a new one or do you scrape it off or what? Yeah, the latter is probably the most likely solution. Um, usually, thankfully, I'm able to identify um, what I've done that doesn't seem to be working. Uh, and, and I will either use a, a, a palette knife or a paper towel or something and just... But you would just scrape it right yeah, off. Yeah, drag it right off. <laughs> Have you had an experience where you're actually painting and it's not going the way you want and you move away from it, you come back and you figure out what the heck was wrong and you turn out a nice piece of work? Fortunately, for whatever reason, uh, since I've come here to Cape Ann, it hasn't happened very much. Um, but what has happened in the past is, is I've taken at least a number of weeks. Uh, on one occasion, it actually took two years um, for a painting. Just, I did something and I just looked at it and I said, I can't do anything <laughs> more right now. I, I don't want to do anything on this. Yeah. And I and just took it, away put it against the wall, yeah. turned, it, turned yeah. it away from me. and. Yeah and buried it in a bunch of things and, yeah. uh, and then started working on other things. When you finish the work and you've been around it for a while, mm -hmm. do you lose interest in it? There's a painting on the wall um, across the gallery from us where I had, uh, I had called it finished, I signed it. As I came into the gallery on a daily basis and walked past the painting sitting in the window, I kept thinking to myself, hmm, I'm not sure that that's working for me. And I lived with it for about three, three weeks or so, and I kept considering, and, and then I finally just said, I, I have to do something about it. And that, that's probably the first time in my whole career I've actually taken a painting and call finished and started working on it again. Um, and I basically changed the time of day. Uh, I changed the direction of the light a little bit, um, and it made it into more, more of a bright painting um, than it was previously, which was kind of dark and, and, and kind of midday-ish, undramatic light. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just originally convinced myself that, that, that the, the fact that it wasn't dramatic lighting was, was kind of interesting because it was different for me. But then it wasn't interesting enough to me to keep me interested, so I decided <laughs> I had to completely give it a great story. story. Yes. <laughs> In terms of paintings, have, has, have you ever done a painting that you really loved so much that you wouldn't part with it? Not so far. Not so far. And that even includes uh, paintings that include my, my beloved wife. Have you done many portraits or paintings in your life? Oh, she used her as a model or a... Yes, exactly, yeah. exactly, yes. Uh, so she's kind of inspired it in a certain way. Like there's one painting in the gallery where um, I built a house around her reading the Sunday New York Times because she's very much a cover-to-cover -cover kind, mm -hmm. of, kind of girl, a real mm -hmm. avid reader of it. And uh, I thought it was interesting and I, and I decided that it was the subject of painting. And um, I'm, I'm glad I did it and it gets a lot of comments from people because People feel like they're being a voyeur in mm -hmm. someone's life, and and uh, yet uh, just exalting the whole idea of, of what it feels like to just walk past the house and catch something out of the corner of your eye and wonder about it. And do you want uh, when you go? Let's say you go with your wife to dinner or something like that. Do you bring a sketchbook or anything like that? 
I don't typically, uh, especially most in particular, uh, it would be because I'm so, I'm so slow and, and I'm ponderous in the way I work. Mm -hmm. um, I, I tend to be uh, a little bit of a perfectionist in some ways. Mm -hmm. And as a result, um, we would probably uh, be told to leave um, much, much sooner than, <laughs> than we would end up having our meal uh, yeah. because I'd still be there. Does your experience as a draftsman come into play when you do your paintings? Um, I'd say probably yes. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that's probably one of the reasons why uh, my work uh, looks so precise in a certain way is because I, I feel uh, it's important to try and, and make things feel real. Mm -hmm. um, and architecture should have straight lines and it should have angles. Uh, and uh, I take my time in order to make those things look believable um, so that part of my real world uh, is something that you're not thinking about, like it, uh, there's something wrong, you know, because that's a distraction and that doesn't allow people to get into the painting if they have a sense that something's wrong or if they even identify something as being wrong. So I try to eliminate that completely and, and to me one of the ways I can do that is just by being accurate. Mm -hmm. Of all the works you've done, do you have a favorite piece? It, I, I've said to people many times that my, my favorite piece is the last one I finished. Yeah. And, and that kind of stays it with you for a while. Yes. You feel the same thing yeah, yourself. Same thing. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, there's a few pieces that do stand out uh, that served as, as being one of the most successful uh, reflections of what I was feeling at the time. Mm -hmm. um, a piece I call Waiting, um, which, uh, in which I took a model, a friend, to uh, uh, just an average American uh, diner. Do you title all your work, too? I do. You do? Yeah. Uh -huh. I feel that I feel that that kind of lends a clue a little bit mm -hmm. to what's behind it, without telling you what you must believe about it, unless it's a literal thing about a place, like Winkish Beach, for mm -hmm. example. Um, and often, uh, when it comes to a painting that I've um, I'm creating for myself, I'll come up with a title that hopefully has a little bit of humor in it, or at least uh, is suggestive without being overt about what the title is. Um, but when I do a commission for someone, uh, which I do sometimes. Um, usually I'm fairly literal about it mm -hmm. and call it what it is. David, I can only thank you for this interview. You've made it very easy and comfortable. And, uh, My pleasure. Thank, thank you. you for you having me too. Thanks, Ed. Thank you. A lot of fun.